Hello everyone, I am the Meta Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck techs. On this episode of The Brewery, I will be discussing my take on the partner pairing of a new commander and a reprinted commander from Commander Legends, Kodama of the East Tree, and Bruce Tall Brewish Herder. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. A more significant way you can help support the channel is my Patreon. For just $1 a month, patrons get early access to scheduled videos on YouTube, while higher tier patrons get access to the VIP section of my Discord server as well. You can find a link to both down in the description. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Kodama is a 6-6 spirit with reach for 4 generic and 2 green. Kodama is probably one of the most degenerate partners of Commander Legends. Whenever you have a permanent enter the battlefield, Kodama allows you to put another permanent of equal or less cost from your hand onto the battlefield, essentially allowing you to cheat casting cost. Not only that, but drop plants as well. Since it's an enter the battlefield trigger, you don't even need to cast that permanent, just having it enter the battlefield is enough. This deck will use landfall triggers to bounce lands and then use the tokens entering to trigger Kodama and then get the lands back. This will not only be an epic engine, but it also has the potential to go infinite. Bruce Tall is included not only as a way to give Kodama access to red and white, but as a way to make a creature dangerous as well. Bruce is his 3-3 human ally for 2 generic, 1 red, and 1 white. Whenever he enters the battlefield or attacks, target creature gets double strike and life link until end of turn. So he could be used to turn Kodama into a 2-turn clock just in case, while also gaining us life in the process. So even though he's used mostly for the colors, he's still useful as a backup plan. In order to understand how the main engine works, let's first see the effects that create tokens via landfall triggers. Emeria Angel, Nesting Dragon, Omnath Locus of Rage, Rampaging Baylos, Scoot Swarm, and Spore Mound are all creatures that create creature tokens via landfall. Creating various types of tokens, each one has their merit, whether it be flyers, beaters, chum blockers, etc. The important thing is the creating the tokens. Of these, the most insane one is Scoot Swarm, since it has the potential of exponentially overwhelming the board all on its own. Photodon Retreat, Retreat to Emeria, and Zendikar's Royal also create tokens via landfall effects but on enchantments, which are harder to interact with than creatures. The retreats can also be used to bump our army when we'd rather have quality over quantity, which can help in ending the game faster. Healed God of the Sun helps in creating tokens at instant speed whenever we want, instead of waiting for landfall triggers just in case. He also works as a mana sink since he doesn't need to tap to create the tokens. Not only that, but he gives vigilance to all of our other creatures, which is more than useful in multiplayer games. Oh, and being an indestructible 5-6 when devotion is met is nothing to scoff at either. Kirkkeep, Jeldren Outpost, and Legion's Landing are lands that can be activated to create tokens at instant speed, but unfortunately need to be tapped to do so. Well, Legion's Landing would have to first transform into Adanto the First Fort before it can be used as a creature creating land. In any case, these lands can also be tapped for mana so they don't take up a slot in the deck. Being able to create tokens besides landfall is a good way to get surprise blockers or drop lands outside of your turn if we can. Doubling Season, Parallel Lives, and Anointed Procession don't create tokens per se, but they do double the amount of tokens you create. Doubling Season has the added bonus of also doubling any counters placed on permanents you control as a bonus. The deck's running may be two cards that benefit from it, but since it doubles tokens, it's not a dead card by any means. Now, as mentioned earlier, Kodama is an epic landfall engine with tokens. This is because when a land enters the battlefield, two triggers enter the stack, Kodama's and the creature token one. Here's where abusing the stack comes in handy. Normally, you can just drop an additional land with Kodama's ability, but if a token also enters the battlefield, the token will trigger Kodama and you can drop yet another land. This helps you play all your lands from your hand just by dropping one land. However, once you run out of lands, you run out of triggers. This is where some of the cards in the deck help getting the most out of it. Let's start with the Ravnik and Bounce lands. Each of these enter tapped, but that doesn't matter. What we care about is that when they enter, they return a Lek Band to our hand. Same goes for its Grove. These lands might not be the best mana base for a lot of decks, but are amazing in landfall decks like this one, and others like Arcellus, Lagoon, Mystic, etc. Let's see how we can take advantage of these. In order to loop through infinite landfall triggers, we need to have at least two of these five bounce lands, Kodama, and a permanent that creates tokens via landfall. Let's see just one example. Assuming we have Emeria Angel, Kodama, and two bounce lands in our hand. Let's see what happens. When we play Celestial Sanctuary, it triggers Kodama, the Angel, and itself. However, stack the lands trigger first, then the Angels, and then Kodamas. That way, they resolve in Philo order, with Kodamas resolving first. This will have Kodama let you drop Boros Garrison with his trigger. However, when it enters, it triggers the Angel and itself. Have the Angel's trigger enter first and then the lands so it resolves first. The land you're going to bounce is itself. Then the Angel's second trigger resolves, creating the 1-1 bird. This triggers Kodama, allowing you to once more drop Boros Garrison. This once more triggers itself and the Angel. You can now do this indefinitely many times until you get infinite landfall triggers, 
infinite tokens, etc. before the stack even empties completely. With Amulet of Vigor in play, the bounce lands will enter the battlefield untapped, meaning that you can tap them for mana before they get bounced, so this can actually give you infinite colored mana as well depending on which lands you're bouncing. As mentioned earlier, this engine can also work with Rift's Grove, but you'd have to use the lair to bounce Celestia's Sanctuary and then use the Sanctuary to bounce the lair. With how redundant these combo pieces are, it's very possible to assemble a similar engine quite often. For example, you don't even need bounce lands to pull this off. With Cloudstone Curio, you can bounce lands back and forth between them. For example, if you had Cloudstone Curio in play and any two lands, you can pull it off. Assuming the same cards as before, but with the Curio and any land in play. Another other land you will play will trigger Kodama, the Curio, and the Angel. Have the triggers enter the stack in the following order. First Kodama, then the Angel, then the Curio. Thus, the Curio resolves first, bouncing the first land you had in play. Then, the Angel resolves, creating a token. This token triggers Kodama. When that resolves, you play the land you just bounced with the Curio. This triggers the Curio and the Angel. Have the Curio resolve first, bouncing the other land. Then, the Angel resolves, creating another token. This token triggers Kodama, allowing you to replay the land. You can now do this infinitely many times as before. This engine also works with Storm Cauldron. With the Cauldron, you only need one land that doesn't enter the battlefield tapped, unless you also have Amulet of Vigor in play. Let's see how it works. If you have Kodama, Emeria Angel, and Storm Cauldron on the battlefield, when you play any land, it's going to trigger Kodama and the Angel. However, in response to the triggers, tap the land for mana, which then triggers the Cauldron, bouncing the land. Now the Angel's trigger resolves, creating a token that triggers Kodama. When its trigger resolves, you play the land you just bounced. This will trigger the Angel. In response to the trigger, tap the land for mana, and then the Cauldron bounces it. You can now do this indefinitely many times, generating infinite mana, infinite tokens, and infinite landfall triggers. You can also achieve this without the token creator, since Kodama's first trigger is enough to replay the land you bounce with Storm Cauldron. This won't get you infinite tokens, but you get infinite landfall triggers and infinite mana. You can also get infinite mana thanks to Lotus Cobra and Stone Cedar Hierophant. If you have any on the battlefield when you're getting infinite landfall triggers, you can get infinite mana regardless of how you assemble the engine. Even though these creatures don't facilitate any loops, they're definitely a broken component of any engine. Any of these infinitely recurring loops lead us to the many win cons of the deck. Doing this with Perforous God of the Forge is an automatic win since infinite creature tokens entering the battlefield will trigger Perforous enough to kill the table. If that weren't enough, you can also use the infinite mana generated to pump your army to infinite power. However, the infinite landfall triggers will also turn Akum Hellkite, Kulsi's Ravager, Spitfire Lagak, and Tunneling GOP into similar win cons. Whereas Perforous pings the entire table for damage when creatures enter the battlefield, these four creatures ping players when lands enter the battlefield. Since we get infinite landfall triggers, we can deal infinite damage. Again, notice how many different ways we can assemble a game-ending combo. We can also win outright with our infinite token armies thanks to Fires of Yamavaya, giving haste to all of our newly created creature tokens. However, the fires aren't the only thing pumping the creatures in the deck. It is possible to not assemble the combo but still create a ton of tokens throughout the game. Beastmaster Ascension, Bow of Nylea, and True Conviction help in making those tokens very dangerous. So even though we're not winning in one full swoop via combo, we can still win via beatdown. The Ascension will achieve that beatdown even faster if we have doubling season in play. Speaking of which, this engine doesn't just work with creature tokens being created. If instead of a permanent that creates creature tokens via landfall, we only had something like Tireless Tracker, we can still achieve infinitely many landfall triggers as if it were a Maria Angel. While the tracker is amazing since it creates clues that can then be used to draw into our deck, especially if we're also generating infinite mana. If we're generating infinite mana, we can then draw into a win con and cast it with the mana. However, if we're not generating infinite mana, we can still use the tracker and clue tokens to generate infinite landfall triggers. So, something like Morag Fury of Comb, which is still an amazing card on the deck, will give us infinite many combat steps. Thus, even if we're not creating infinitely many tokens, infinitely many combat steps might still be enough to win the match. Even then, if we don't have an infinite engine online, with enough extra combat steps and creatures, that might be all we need to win. Especially if we have something like Admonition Angel on the battlefield. With infinite landfall triggers, we can O-ring all non-land permanents our opponents control, leaving them open to any and all attacks especially infinitely many attacks and or attackers. The deck does run conventional removal with Chaos Warp, Beast Within, and Generous Gift just in case, so don't worry. These are pretty self-explanatory, but at least Admonition Angel is amazing to essentially exile our opponent's boards once we have the combo online. As mentioned earlier, Tireless Tracker isn't the only way the deck is drawing cards off of Landfall. Seer Sundial, Horn of Greed, and Nissa Vital Force are also included for that. We do have to pay 2 mana with each trigger with the Sundial, so it's not super reliable if we're not generating mana as well, but if we are generating mana as well, as playing lands, then it becomes incredibly degenerate as seen earlier. 
Unfortunately, Horn of Greed also benefits opponents, but at least it's not as often as us. The true downside of the Horn is that it's not a pure land of all trigger. The land has to actually be played. But that's not a problem since the deck has plenty of ways of allowing us to drop multiple lands for the turn, which we're going to see soon. Nissa's Emblem is what has us draw a card each time a land enters a battlefield, but this emblem is incredibly easy to achieve. She just needs to survive one turn around the board. However, if we had Doubling Season in play before playing Nissa, we can ultimate her that same turn and she sticks around. We can also draw cards off of Return of the Wild Speaker, Rishkar's Expertise, and Soul's Majesty. Kadama alone will have us draw 6 cards off of any of these spells, so that in and of itself is great value. However, with power pumping effects in the deck, it is possible to draw way more. Oh, and since this deck can also be a beatdown, Return of the Wild Speaker can also be used as a mass pump spell for all of our non-human creatures, which is amazing as well. The final draw effect is via Toski Beer of Streakwitz. With so many creature tokens being created, having Toski can go a long way in drawing us a ton of cards. If that weren't enough, it's also indestructible, so it'll stick around after a wrath. This card is amazing, but even more so in a tokens deck like this one. Even though the deck can generate infinite mana from a lot of these engines, Kadama does cost a whopping 6 mana to cast, and even more if it gets dealt with. This is why we have to take advantage of being green and accelerate as quickly as possible. Thus the deck is running my favorite trifecta of Farseek, Nature's Lore, and 3 Visits. Not only are these amazing on their own, but they also have the potential of giving us more landfall triggers in the same turn. And, if we already have Kodama out, can help us in dropping yet another land from our hand from his trigger. Speaking of playing additional lands, Mina and Den Wildborn, Azusa Lost but Seeking, Dread of the Leasing Grove, Wayward Swordtooth, and Exploration are also in the deck. Once Kodama is out, every land we get on the battlefield without it will have a drop of land from our hand. So while these effects might seem superlative and redundant, keep in mind that we still have to get Kodama out before we can take advantage of its shenanigans. Mina and Den in particular are the best ones since we can use them to bounce lands, which we already saw how busted it is in the deck. The deck is also running Remanop Excavator and Ancient Green Warden, as well as all 10 fetch lands, to help with those multiple instances of landfall. What's great about the fetch lands and Kodama is that it can be used to have Kodama drop 2 lands from our hand all on its own. Being able to play a fetch land from our graveyard each turn is immensely busted in a deck like this one. Not only that, but if we're doing it with Ancient Green Warden, then our landfall triggers are doubled. In order to diversify our mana base, Birds of Paradise, Avancins Pilgrim, Lanoir Elves, Finhorn Elves, Elvish Mystic, and Dryad Arbor are included as your standard suite of mana dorks. Dryad Arbor is the best of these since it's also a land, so it will trigger landfall as well. It can also be fetched for thanks to having the forest subtype. The rest of the mana dorks being one drops is key in getting out fast mana for Kadama. The deck's also running Growing Lots of Illumok. Not only is this helpful in filtering the top 4 cards for any combo pieces, since most combo pieces are creatures, but when it transforms into Illumok Cradle of the Sun, it's a better guide as Cradle. With the amount of creatures in the deck and creature tokens being created, this will tap for a ton of mana. With Stone Cedar Hierophant untapping it thanks to Landfall, the amount of green mana this can potentially generate in the game is crazy. Rounding out the mana base is Soul Ring and Mana Crypt. Nothing of note since these are your standard commander mana rocks. Even with the amount of times it's been reprinted, Mana Crypt might be a bit on the expensive side, but it's not necessary for the deck to function. The deck's also running Jeweled Lotus, which not only goes a long way in casting Kadama, but Bruce as well. Jeweled Lotus is nowhere near as expensive as when it was spoiled, but its price is steadily creeping. That being said, just as with Mana Crypt, it's not necessary for the deck to function, and budget substitutes will do just fine. Just keep in mind that casting Mana Crypt or Jeweled Lotus means we get to drop a land for free if we already had Kodama in play. The rest of the deck is just the rest of the lands. The deck's running all three dual lands, all three shock lands, all three battle bond lands, Command Tower, Reflecting Pool, Exotic Orchard, Ancient Tomb, and Temple of the False God, as well as two of each snow-covered basic land, in case anyone's running anything that benefits us for it. As with all my deck techs, it's not entirely necessary to run the dual lands if you don't already have them or aren't playing online. You can easily swap them out for Pain Lands, Pathway Lands, or even more basic lands, and the deck will still function just fine. Recall that the deck's also running Rift's Grove, all four Ravnagan Bounce Lands, and all ten Fesh Lands. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Kadama with Bruce Tarl. You could just as easily partner Kadama with Tago in order to have the Landfall engine right in the command zone, but you'd lose access to white. That being said, having access to both red and white gives Kadama the accessibility of all the Landfall cards that create tokens upon their trigger. So not only can this make an abusable engine, but it gives different configurations for the same engine as well as different ones that provide different avenues to victory, especially since we still have access to Perforos and the other red permanents that ping from Landfall. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me, and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of the Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I'm the Benedict Kirby, and happy brewing!